Hello, and welcome to the Canadian Story, where we discuss what Canada is, what Canada could be, and what Canada should be. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Canadian Story. I'm very excited for this episode because my first ever political boss in a war room is joining us. Her name is Danielle Smith. Many Albertans will be aware of her. For those who aren't, Danielle Smith has held many roles and been a, a, an advocate for Alberta for basically her whole adult life that I'm aware of. She is an expert on policy. She was on, um, she had her own radio show for six years. She was the leader of the Wild Rose Party. Welcome to the show, Danielle Smith. This is well, a real honor. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thank you, David. And hello, Zach. I'm looking forward to talking to both of you. This is such a great idea to the concept for this podcast, getting people talking about their experience from different perspectives in the country and helping to educate people like Zach about why it is we're so sad and feeling <laughs> exactly and feeling exactly. and feeling alienated out here in the West. <laughs> exactly. I've learned so, so I've learned so much. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly it. We've had this series of podcasts uh, on the Canadian story about Alberta, particularly not just because I'm from there, but because I see Alberta's place in Confederation as the greatest threat to Canadian unity that could fall apart and may very well fall apart. But I want your perspective on why that's the case, Danielle. Why are Albertans upset? I, can I, you know, I'm going to turn the tables. This is what happens when you're a talk show host for six years. You get used to asking questions. But Zach, was, right. I said something really interesting when we, the, when we were off the air. And I just want him to say it on the air again, if he can, because I think it will help frame my answer a bit. And, and maybe I'll ask it this way, Zach, is one of the things you said is before you started doing this series, you didn't even realize that we had grievances in Alberta. I I can tell you them all. So don't, don't you worry. I'll get right to that. But I want to know, what did you think of Alberta or did you think about us at all prior to doing this series? Yeah. I mean, perhaps my perspective is a little bit tainted because David comes from Alberta. So I've had family in Alberta. When I was 12 years old, I went out and I visited Alberta and absolutely fell in love with it. Um, I love open spaces. I love the country. Uh, David took me hunting for the first time. We went and shot gophers in his neighbor's field. <laughs> um, so I have always loved Alberta. Um, but I guess my ignorance is just a, a product of not keeping an eye on the political climate of the country as a whole until really we started this project and, and maybe a, a year before that. Oh, thanks so much. You know, Zach, you just described being an Albertan. I think you're actually, your soul, your spirit is Albertan. So you may have to relocate. I agree. I would, I, agree. I, would, I would agree with you on that. I look at Alberta now knowing what I know and a lot of what Alberta stands for and values. Um, I consider myself to share those same values. So I feel, I feel though distant, right on the same page as you guys. You, you well, know, I, I like to say it, and Derek says, Derek Fildebrandt often says, he says, there's more Albertans in Ontario than there are in Alberta. It's such a great <laughs> way of putting it, really. You know, Maxime Bernier also, whenever uh, he used to come out here, he, he used to call himself the Albertan from Quebec. <laughs> and I can see why he would say yes. it, because he's, he's yes. got a lot of his ideas as well are in sync with where Alberta is. You know, for, for me... It's been it's been interesting over the past month to watch the the trucker convoy, because just seeing all of the people at the roadside waving Canadian flags and cheering on freedom and waving signs, I think I think there is a nut there that we can build on in the conservative movement centered around issues of freedom. And I, I guess the thing that I've that I've been most frustrated about for the last uh, number of years, I mean, I've been frustrated with our own government in Alberta, because I, I felt like we should have been that beacon of freedom all the way through. I understand what happened with the the uncertainty people had when COVID came about in April. But you know what, by the time we hit September of 2020, we could have gone the direction of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. And we could have talked about focus protection and therapeutics and making the right decisions. And I think that's maybe why I'm feeling a bit frustrated is that I feel like Alberta should have continued to be the standard bearer of freedom and liberty, because that's who we are. And now we've got a bit of a, a muddied, image because we, we we didn't do all of those things. We didn't follow on that course. So if we could just turn the clock back two years so I could talk about the Alberta in my conception of what it is, notwithstanding yes, yes. what we've seen over the last two years. The, the thing that I found so interesting was one of the last interviews that I had 
on the air was with uh, Gerard Belzil, uh, rest his soul. He was a researcher with um, uh, the Montreal Economic Institute. And I asked him the, the question, like, why is it that, that Quebecers don't appreciate Alberta? Why don't you like Alberta? And he says, you know what? We just don't think about you at all. And in fact, we are too busy thinking about ourselves. And maybe you guys should start thinking more about yourselves for a change. And so that really struck me because I, I had felt like Alberta has been such a target, but I don't know that we're the, a target by our fellow uh, citizens, by, by well-meaning people. I think we're definitely a target of activists. We're definitely a punching bag of politicians. And that to me is where we've seen the division being created is that for whatever reason, politicians have felt like they can dogpile on Alberta and our industry and our people and our values, because they think it's a way to score political points in their own region. And that's irresponsible, in my opinion. Politicians should be trying to find the things that unite us as opposed to the things that divide us. And that, to me, I think has created the, the, the biggest problems in our country in the last two years. But going back to, I think, the breaking point for Albertans, and this, it's a different point for different people, but this, to me, encapsulated it. It was when uh, Quebec Premier Francois Legault got elected. He was touted as being this pro-business candidate. And I thought, oh, great. Now we're going to be able to have a partnership with Quebec. Maybe we can get Energy East back on track. We can have a nation-building project that will bring us all together. We'll talk about energy security. It's going to be fantastic. And then 50,000 protesters uh, showed up in Montreal protesting on climate change. This was when Greta Thunberg was making her name and he did a, com a complete reversal. So within the space of a couple of days, we, we heard Francois Legault say that he would not support the, the pipeline. He didn't want Alberta's dirty oil. That was the language that he used. And then it turned out that there was extra money in the equalization fund. So Bill Morneau, the finance minister at the time, just said, well, why don't we just give an extra billion dollars to Quebec, even though we were suffering financially since 2014 with a hole blown out in the market for oil and gas prices. We were running massive deficits. They were running surpluses and they were getting more money from transfers that was still being generated from the federal tax that we paid at the same time as they were basically saying, we, we want to cut you off at the knees, but keep sending the money. That was it. For Albertans. I, I think that that was the week when Albertans decided there was no way that we could continue with the relationship as it was, and we needed to, to do something different. And I think that that's been the, the only, the big problem with that is that the activists, the extreme environmental activists, and the politicians responding to them have made matters worse since that point. So it's just been a steady drumbeat of Albertans feeling underappreciated, undervalued, but the, the but there's this sense that everybody wants to keep the money rolling. And there's a line, Albertans aren't gonna put up with that anymore. I think it is about Alberta that makes it special. Like I wanna go into, you love this place, you've dedicated essentially your life to this place, your home, where you were born and raised. Why? Well, what do you love I'll, about this place? You know, I've, I've lived in other places. And so, and I travel an awful lot. And I, I lived in British Columbia for a couple of years. So I understand that the, the, the culture in British Columbia is quite different. Um, I took a semester of school at Carleton. So I also understand sort of the culture of Ontario and on, on Ottawa in particular, since it's so heavily influenced by by Quebec is quite different. And I'm, you know, I'm fine with that. I don't expect every province to be like Alberta, but I expect that our friends in Confederation will let Alberta be Alberta. And Al Alberta starts, I think, from a very different perspective that um, I'm, a, I'm a libertarian, a lot of, it's a terrible word. I wish we had a better word for it because people don't know what it means. But it, at, at its base, it means that your foundation is liberty. And if you start from a foundation of liberty, it changes your conception of what government is and what it should do for you. And I think this is the real problem. If you're from central Canada, you look at government principally as a source of good. You want government to do more for you. And the more centralized government, the better, because heck, why would we want a patchwork of programs across the country? Why don't we have the federal government doing it, everything? I would say that if you want to understand why Alberta is so different, it's the exact reverse of that. It would be that the very first thing that we want people to do is to be able to live their best life as an individual and to have opportunities for good schooling, good education, good jobs, 
and so that they can take care of themselves first and foremost. And then it's, it broadens out beyond that. Once you take care of yourself, you're doing well, you can take care of your family. You want to be able to buy a house and put your kids through school and be able to go watch them and they're at their softball and hockey games and be able to go on a couple of, of vacations and, and just pretty well be left alone. Most of us, I think, in Alberta don't look to government as our, our first source of support. Uh, the other thing I'd say about Albertans broadening it out again from there is community. If you look at the statistics on the level of support that we give to nonprofits and the level of support we give to charities and volunteerism and the fact that we've got so many wealthy philanthropists, I mean, you can't go to a, a hospital or a a, a, a university campus without seeing the names of some of the, the great titans of business who have, have given so generously when they've done well. So they give back. So we've got a very community-based culture here where we, we take care of ourselves, take care of our families, take care of our neighbors. And if we do really well, there's an expectation that we're going to give back to the community. And that is such a strong foundation. When you have that, it doesn't mean that you're looking to government for everything. So then you, then you want to be able to have... If you're going to, to, to look at, at this whole principle, and I'm going to get really nerdy, and David's going to have to, to, to or Zach's <laughs> going to have to step in. But it is, I, I got introduced to this principle of subsidiarity when I was working at the Fraser Institute. Gordon Gibson talked about it. It's this idea that the level of government that should govern should be the one closest to the people. So yeah, we should be empowering our municipalities to do more and take care of us more. Because the nice part about municipalities delivering programs is if you don't like what one municipality is doing, if they're taxing you too much and doing too much and getting involved in too much in woke identity politics, you can move to another municipality. Um, the other thing then is that you want your provincial government doing more for you. And this is my, my grave, grave frustration with the federal government is that it seems like people get elected to federal office and what they really wanna be is a provincial premier. There's no role for the federal government in healthcare or education, or long-term care, or pharmace pharmaceuticals. Every time I hear federal politicians talking about areas of provincial jurisdiction, I say, why don't you quit and run at the provincial level? Because <laughs> yeah. often what they do, truly, what they do, look what they did with daycare. They, they dangle a tiny little bit of money out in front of politicians and say, hey, we'll give you this tiny little bit of money, but you've got to run the program our way. They don't have the expertise uh, to run these programs. Yes. But they do it all the time. So why do we say yes? Why don't we just say no? So the federal government, I think, here's my conception of how the country should work, because it's just the exact opposite, is that the federal government's job is to make sure that our borders are protected. National defense, making sure that we've got a proper immigration uh, policy, make sure that we've got good trade agreements, make sure that we have um, we can deal with things like organized crime and human trafficking. These are really serious issues that require the federal government's attention. And I don't know why they don't focus on that area. And then what we need to do, I think, is shift to more of a European Union style of model. I mean, I don't know how we ever agreed, essentially, that government will just let you take all of our money you can keep as much as you want and then just send us back some dribbles. That's kind of how it works. Um, whereas in the European Union, you, we should have the, the notion where we collect our own resources locally, and then we pay the federal government our share of the services that they provide on our collective behalf. I think that would be a much healthier way to run the country. I think it would be a way for us to finally have some common cause with Quebec, because Quebec clearly is moving in that direction. And I think it would just lead to a better federation. And that, that I think is a real problem is that we've just been asking our federal government to, to, to do too much. They tax us too much. They spend too much in areas that aren't our jurisdiction. They micromanage us too much. And they end up putting barriers in our way to be successful. So I'm, I'm trying to find something I can say positive about how things are working right now. <laughs> and I can't yeah, find it's hard. It's hard. just little. Yeah. <laughs> So, so exactly. let me, Ask let me, uh, yeah. yeah, let me challenge you on that because I agree with you. I really do. I, I love the, uh, turns out I should be in Alberta because I resonate with essentially everything that you said, but I want to ask, so what about, so, uh, the idea that the federal government should be involved less hundred percent behind that. Um, the idea that provinces should keep more of their money and, uh, give less to the federal government and have a greater amount of control within their jurisdiction. Yes. But that. The, the, the caution I have there is that Alberta would obviously be an incredibly lucrative, lucrative province because of all of the natural resource. What about some of the maritime provinces that are not 
in such a good fisc- uh, fiscal condition? How would they survive in a climate like that? It's, you know, it's interesting because I think that you, you could have other mechanisms of support, but here's the problem that we have with all of our transfer mechanisms like re- that we have right now, if I can speak frankly. Uh, part of what, what happened was I, Quebec, Quebec was behind on economic development for a whole variety of reasons. There's lots of tension in the country or in the province because a lot of the businesses were owned by the minority English speaking community. And I think the Francophones felt like they didn't have control over their, their own destiny. And so fair enough. Um, I understand why the quiet revolution took place, but why are we still acting as if that's the case in Quebec today? We've created a situation where maybe we were so shell- shell-shocked by what happened in the 70s with the FLQ crisis, and we were rattled by the fact that they almost voted to separate in 1995, that we've created our entire infrastructure of government to siphon money out of uh, the places that that are, are prosperous so that the money is in Ottawa, so that Ottawa can design programs principally to benefit Quebec, whether it's equalization, or um, other types of transfers, whether it's the contracts that that go out, the unseemly relationship they seem to have with a number of Quebec-based um, big, uh, headquartered businesses, the fact that they expected us to turn a blind eye to uh, to, to SNC Lavalin and its skullduggery, and and this is, I guess, the real problem is. If we if we were going to help design a program that would help those regions that really couldn't generate enough revenue to have a reasonably comparable level of services, I don't think you'd have Albertans on, uh, opposed to that. But Quebec's not in that category. Quebec gets uh, what thirteen billion dollars a year in transfers through the equalization program. They've started a fund. They are growing their own prosperity fund. At the same time, in Alberta, everybody, all the politicians have been terrified about adding more money to the heritage fund because, oh my goodness, it might make us a target of the rest of the country. Even though we are a target of the rest of of the country, the politicians anyway. So, so I guess the way I'm looking at this is that Quebec is now in a situation where they have been able to use their leverage and political threats from the past to create a federation that is imbalanced. They get the lion's share of the benefit. They continue to be a net recipient of federal transfers. We we send by far more money to to, uh, to Quebec than they generate in taxes. And, and that I think is, is where the, the, the real problem lies. We shouldn't be taking money out of BC and Alberta and Ontario so that Quebec can have subsidized daycare and Quebec can have um, a lower tuition that their their students pay. And so that Quebec can have cheap hydro rates where the rest of us don't have have cheap electricity rates. And that's the problem is that we're, we're seeing that we're transferring money to Quebec so Quebec can offer better programs than are available in any of the other jurisdictions. And that's not what that was supposed to be about. But the equalization program was to make sure that if you lived in poor PEI, which only has 100 or 120,000 citizens, that they could have a hospital so that they didn't have to fly to a different (laughs) jurisdiction to get services. So that they could have schools and so that they could have a have access to universe. I don't even know if there is a university in Charlottetown. I should I should know. Maybe you guys know, but but that's not that's what, what equalization was supposed to be for. And if a provinces were able to make the case that they had a shortfall um, and that they needed it to, in order to be able to offer equivalent services, I think we could structure a program that way. But we can't do that with equalization. Equalization has got to be phased out completely. And then we have to develop some kind of new supports that would allow us to, to make sure that, that, the, that those regions are supported properly. But this, this siphoning of money, uh, principally from Alberta, to run it through the, uh, the machine in Ottawa so that it can be distribu- distributed to Quebec, we see it. We're, n- we're not going to pretend it's anything other than what it is, which is a vote buying mechanism. And Albertans have had enough, quite frankly. And I think that the, the Quebec, Quebecers uh, leaders really misplayed that one. Because if Alberta was allowed to continue to be Alberta, 
If we were allowed to build pipelines and expand our, our, our bitumen development capacity and expand our conventional oil and gas and export LNG so that we could help our friends in Europe so they didn't have to rely on Russia for natural gas, so that we could help our friends in the United States so they didn't have to rely on hostile regimes. If we had support across the country to do that, the energy security and energy affordability had a place for Alberta as well. They could have continued on with us, probably without us even raising raising much of a fuss about the continued transfers to Ottawa. But for them to say that those things must stop, that oil and gas must be kept in the ground, that our Alberta businesses are getting confiscated in their long-term leases because uh, because of an arbitrary policy change where they're where they're creating such bottlenecks in processes and campaigning against us so we get pipeline capacity canceled with a cancel Port Saguenay that was that was would have been one of the projects that would have helped our friends in Germany if we'd been able to export Western Canadian natural gas through LNG in, off the coast of Quebec. If, if they're going to stand in the way of our ability to, uh, to, to realize everything we want to on the, on, the, on the economic front so that our people can benefit, so that our customers can benefit, then, then that's where they're going to continue to get opposition. Now, I, don't see that, I don't see that being resolved yet, and that's a real problem. There's some good voices, though, in Quebec. I mean, the new uh, conservative leader, Eric Duham, he's also a... a he um, was on our a, podcast. Yeah, oh, there you go. He's also an yeah, yeah. Albertan. He's a spiritual yes. Albertan. Yeah, I, I would <laughs> say so, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> So someone yeah. like him so could I, heal. A, someone like him could heal the country. Uh, we need we need to have someone that we can that. negotiate with on the other side who sees the world the way we do, and we haven't had that for a long time. I couldn't agree more. So, why do you think? So obviously, the question that everyone's going to ask then is, how do we deal with the environmentalists? Right? How do we deal with the people who are absolutely one hundred percent committed to the notion that the world is about to burn, and if we don't like these people are a religion, right? They are they are fanatics. And not, I don't mean that in a negative way. They truly believe they're saving the world and they're going to act that way. How do we, the rational, business-loving people who just want our province to do well and people to have good lives, deal with these fanatics? Well, I don't think that we can ever win over the Greta Thunberg and Naomi Klein crowd. And, and so we have to just recognize that some people are so ideological that they're not reachable. Anyone who now, in the face of what we're seeing in Europe, in the face of what we're seeing in North America, I, I gather that Toronto's gasoline prices are now up over $170 per liter. Anyone who is looking at- You mean one hundred. One dollar and seventy cents per liter. One dollar, sorry, one hundred and seventy yeah. cents. A dollar, <laughs> yeah. what? A dollar uh -oh. seventy per liter. Uh oh. <laughs> I know we were about to go do a run on the gas yeah. stations there. Zach right? was like, "I gotta go. I gotta go." <laughs> <laughs> I only got buck a quarter 70. tank. <laughs> but a buck 70 per liter, um, the fact that, I mean, our, our electricity and gasoline and home heating bills in Alberta during this um, with this, with this winter freeze in, in January have, have doubled. You, you look at the, at the turmoil inter, internationally, the geopolitics of, of what's going on in the fight over getting um, a ready supply of, uh, of, of cheap available fuel, the fact that you've got Africa and uh, and India and South America, who all have uh, regions that want to have the same quality of life as we do, we are going to see an increase in the demand for energy. And if you look at all of that and you say, oh, well, we'll just install solar panels and we'll install solar lanterns and we'll put up wind farms and we'll have battery power. And that's going to fuel an industrialized economy that will bring 8 billion people on the planet up to the same quality of life as North America. It's bananas that 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 anybody would even believe that. So you you've now begun to see moderate environmentalists emerge. Someone like Michael Schellenberger, uh, who wrote Apocalypse Never recently, he he used to be of that view that we could only look at renewable sources. And then he looked at it and he said, "Gosh, you know what? Wind and solar take up a lot of space, and the batteries that you need, all the rare earth mining that you need to do to get all of those minerals to create those batteries." That causes a lot of disruption. What we should be looking at 
is how we can have concentrated energy sources so that you can have a smaller footprint and a smaller land base delivering the kind of energy that we need. And so this is why he's not hostile to uh, natural gas in particular, which is one of the, the major sources that, that we should be using to expand uh, uh, affordable electricity use around the world, but he's also a huge proponent of nuclear. So he's a bit of an outlier in the environmental community. Even looking at Michael Moore and Jeff Gibbs and their book, Planet of the Humans, it's a bit dark how they ended it. I mean, they think there's too many people on the planet, uh, but they came to the conclusion as well that everything we've been told about wind and solar and biomass being more environmentally friendly, it's, it's just frankly not true. Um, here's, I'll give you an example. This was said, was said to me by, by somebody that I interviewed for, for one of the shows that I do, Greg Fagnan. He said, so, so this is what the environmentalists are having us believe, that you would uh, take coal out of the side of a mountain in Crow's Nest Pass in Alberta, put it on a truck to take it to a depot where you could put it on a train, take it to the coast where you put it on a vessel that uses the worst bunker fuel in the world, take it across to China where you put it on a train, then a truck to take it to a plant that turns it all into a solar panel, put it back on the truck, on the train, uh, onto the tanker, back on the other side after it comes across the ocean, onto the train, onto the truck, installed onto the home in Crow's Nest Pass as a solar panel. And that's supposed to be more environmentally friendly than any of the other types of energy sources that we use. It's bananas. You cannot so, make... So let, let, let me, me clear, can let, I, let, let me just rant a little bit more on this one. <laughs> because you cannot be net zero on solar panels until the uh, the the silicon crystalline crystalline silicon silicon is net zero. You cannot be net zero on uh, on wind turbines until cement is net zero, and steel is net zero, and fiberglass is net zero, and the fifteen hundred truckloads it takes to get it to the site is net zero. So this is the real problem: is that we've never looked at the full chain of CO two emissions and environmental impact on any of those types of products, including the mining. And, and that is why our resources by comparison look like they're, they're so much more polluting. And so if we were to have an honest discussion about this, we, we, we would be able to, I think, win over the hearts and minds of the moderate environmentalist, the moderate voter. I think the energy industry, sadly, the traditional hydrocarbon industry, they just felt like, well, of course people need us. They know they need us. Every time they go and fill up their tank, they know they need us. And they, they, they got behind. They got 10 years behind on the PR campaign. And so now they're making up for lost time. But I think that we've got a great environmental story to tell. And it's part of the reason why I got back into business advocacy is I, I wanted more opportunities to be able to tell it. Okay, let me zip it. And then, sorry, Zach, you wanted to jump in. <laughs> yeah, so my question is the the story of the, the truck to the train, to the boat, to the you know foreign land and back. Um, is very compelling. Do you know approximately what uh, what percentage of our, for instance, solar panel production uh, happens overseas compared to what is done domestically? I don't know. I thought it was all of it because we, we mostly it's pretty much all of it. We don't we really have China. much manufacturing here yet. Yeah, and the worst part is, is that we don't actually even have a, a, an ability to recycle all those panels. That's the, that's the other environmental problem that's coming around the, the bend here, is that as these um, wind turbines and solar farms get decommissioned, what do we do with all this stuff? I think what we do right now is landfill it, hoping somebody comes up with a pro with a solution to this problem. And so it's just that it's so new that I don't think that we've seen the incredible amount of, of waste stream that's going to develop from that yet. But we, we're going to we're going to have to face that too. And you know, it goes without saying as well with wind turbines and the the, the death of bats and migratory birds. It never made any sense to me that it caused an international furor when ducks died on the Suncor pond because of uh, the guns failing to go off to scare them to scare them off. And rightly so, they put in measures to try to prevent that from happening again. But there's there's blanket liability protection on killing migratory birds from the from the wind turbine industry. How is that even possible? And Seems why like is a that a bit of a double standard, doesn't it? Completely, it does. So those are the kind of things I think that Albertans are feeling very frustrated about. I should say one more thing, just because I love our industry so much. One of the things that conservatives have always said is that technology and innovation and entrepreneurship would would solve any environmental problems. Let me put just a few things on the table for you to consider, which is why I feel like we can get to net zero 
in our industry and we can get there faster than anywhere else. And I'll tell you a few of the reasons why I say that. So one of them is I grew up in the 90s. So I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm 50 now. And the very first environmental issue that I heard about was acid rain. That was going to kill us all. And guess what happened? They came up with a solution to have scrubbers so that we didn't have sulfur dioxide in the air anymore. And so we moved on to the next issue. What was that? It was the ozone layer. It was We were killing it because of chlorofluorocarbons. So what did they do? Well, they came up with some replacement for Freon. And so we still have air conditioning, but it's done in a way that that, that, that moved on from a problem. Uh, you could talk about PCBs and DDT and all of that as well. Every single time we've identified a problem, industry has come up with a solution for it. So I've, I've always felt like CO2 would have some kind of, of uh, innovative solution for it. And, and, and sure enough, uh, it's happening everywhere. When I, when I first joined Alberta Enterprise Group as a president, I started calling around to all of our members to find out what was going on out there. Every single one of them has net zero on their mind and how they're going to get there. And, and with some of the things that are emerging is I think the most exciting areas are number one, our whole discussion around carbon tech. How do we take CO2 and turn it into useful products? And we've done this before. We did this with the Haber-Bosch process, which takes nitrogen out of the air and uh, mixes it with natural gas so that we have ammonia, which we can turn into fertilizer. If we hadn't had scientists figure out how to do that, the carrying capacity of the earth for people would have only been about 3 billion people. They had no idea when they developed this process that they would enable us to grow to ultimately 8 billion people on the planet. And so we've done this before. So the idea that you would take CO2 out of the air and turn it into useful products is not a big leap for me to think that 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 um, some of our entrepreneurs are going to be able to do it, and they already are. So they're, they're, we have carbon technology installed at the Boundary Dam in Saskatchewan and the Shell Quest project in Alberta. We've got carbon capture projects as well at coal plants um, in, in Edmonton and, uh, and one at the natural gas plant in Calgary. And they partnered on an X prize with companies to figure out how to make useful products out of that pure stream of CO2. Isn't Elon Musk involved in that as well, I believe? This is like, the next stage. Yeah. Well, this is the next stage. Uh, there's a, a young guy by the name of Kevin Krauser who comes from the traditional drilling industry. So it's his family started beaver drilling, which has been very successful. But he now runs a company called Avatar Technologies, Avatar Innovation. And he was chasing after Elon Musk to, and ultimately got the, uh, the foundation to put up a $100 million X prize for direct air capture, figuring out ways to take CO2 directly from the atmosphere and turn it into useful products as well. I think the most promising one is to use algae because you can take algae out of the out of the air and use it for a couple, bunch of things. The blue algae can be used for the dye on M&Ms and Smarties. So if you're eating a blue M&M or Smartie, you're saving the planet because you've captured some CO2. But it can also be turned into different types of fuel. And this is where you get into the concept of a circular economy. Because if you're producing CO2 and then you're planting something that will capture it, turning it into a fuel and releasing it, but capturing it again, then then you're 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 you do have a net zero impact on on the atmosphere, and that's what we're supposed to be striving for is net zero. So let me just rattle off a few other things because the, again, I think this is the most exciting part of the of the innovation story is that we can capture CO two and turn it into industrial minerals. One of the interviews that I did was with somebody who could put a membrane on your furnace and it. Would would create it would capture the co2 he'd take it away and he'd be able to make soap we um uh, can turn it into eth uh, to poly uh, polyethylene so that you can make plastics you can turn it into um a, a, a more durable and hardened cement so that you can make a better quality cement you can create carbon nanofiber which is a, a construction material that could potentially replace steel and so that would then reduce our reliance on having to do steel imports. And my favorite is that you can turn it into ethylene. So you have a pure alcohol. Uh, and there's a company called Airco, which makes uh, which makes a vodka out of a pure stream of CO2. And so to me, uh -huh. like, why would we oppose that? This to me is exactly what conservatism is about. It's about supporting entrepreneurs, looking at new ideas, finding a pathway for them to get to market, celebrating what they do, and just watching them transform the economy. And so it took us a while to get there. 
I think we had some false starts. I think we had some business leaders who didn't think they really had to do it. And then when they did, it was a token investment in solar over here or a token investment over there. But I can tell you, everybody's kicked into high gear now. And I think that we are going to, we're going to transform the whole discussion if we're allowed to. If we're allowed to say that ener the traditional energy sector has a role to play, they have the money, they have the means, they have the motivation, they've got the know-how, the technology, the engineers, they can do it. And I think we could be, we'll be net zero faster than, than Quebec will. And, right. and then, and this is my joke, if we're at net zero faster than Quebec, because I didn't even mention the other part, which is we've got all of these, ca these caverns, this ge geological formation under our surface that allows us to capture CO2 and store it. I personally think we're going to be able to develop a lot of useful products, so I, I don't talk about this one as much. But even if we, we are so successful that we capture so much CO2 that we can't turn it all into useful products, then we can store it. And if we start doing that and we can monetize that stream, then Quebec will be paying us for a change because we'll be providing the service <laughs> of capturing their CO2 emissions. Yes. Uh, so you okay, said, so, you said oh. hold on, if you're allowed to, if, if traditional energy is allowed to have a part of the conversation, what are your roadblocks? The roadblock right now is the attitude in Quebec. The, the, the bit just, there've been a, a couple of, and the reason Quebec is such a problem, just, just so that I can, I can piece these things together, is that I think we've seen with the country that it is very, very difficult to form a stable coalition to allow you to win a majority government unless your leader is from Quebec. I mean, we've had the occasional anomaly, Stephen Harper being the most recent one. But if you look through our history of who of our, our various prime ministers, most of them come from Quebec. So there's a certain reality that in order to win, you've got to win in Quebec. So what Quebec thinks about how the country ought to run is vitally important to moving anything forward. Secondarily, because we've got bilingual requirements, it's so much easier for um, a, a native francophone to learn English than a native anglophone to learn French. It's just that there's an immersion aspect and an, ex, an, uh, an exposure aspect. And so most of the bureaucracy at the federal level is also from Quebec. So the attitudes in Quebec also govern um, from that level, what the what the direction of the country is going to be. So, so this is why I say the barriers are in Quebec. So when you see Francois Legault saying, we don't want to take your dirty oil, we had a project on Port Saguenay that was supposed to take Western Canadian gas, liquefy it, and export it to our friends in Europe, cancelled. You um, now see that they are, are cancelling oil and gas development exploration rights in Quebec. And you've got Stephen Gobeau, who is the new environment minister, claiming, hey, I'm an activist. This is just who I am. He has actively campaigned against both natural gas and nuclear. And he's the person at the helm of making decisions. And, what, and, what it, and the reason it matters is that the federal government has inserted itself into um, the approval process for all of our major projects. If a pipeline goes across border, that becomes a federal regulatory issue. All of our major mining projects, federal regulatory issue. And so we've seen Northern Gateway get canceled by federal edict. Uh, Energy East get canceled because of too many regulatory barriers. Keystone get canceled because we had a, a, a prime minister who wouldn't use his relationship with Joe Biden to make sure that it didn't get canceled. Tech Frontier Mine, another major project that was supposed to expand bitumen development, canceled because they'd spent a, over a billion dollars and couldn't see a path forward to, to completion and approval. So, so much of the attitude about our energy sector comes from this group, this extreme group of environmentalists who think the only solution is to keep it in the ground. That's not the solution. The solution is to make sure that the CO2 emissions either stay in the ground or get captured into a product so that they don't go into the atmosphere. And, it, and that's a very different question with a, a huge number of different answers. And so that's what I'm worried about is that they have spent so much time investing in this fanciful notion that we can solve this problem with nothing but wind and solar and battery backup, that we have a lot of work to do to try to undo some of, the, some of that thinking. And we're just getting started. The conversations that I'm having here with you, I just found out about all of this stuff in the last couple of years. And I just started seeing some real um, uh, action on, on some of these projects in the last year. So we've got a lot of walking the walk to do to be able to persuade our friends in the rest of the country that this is real this time. But we need to be given a chance to do that. Oh, Danielle, you're giving me hope, which is awesome. I, I think our industry, I like, I love this province. I love our industry, but I, I want to talk about 
the political barriers that we're facing and and um and perhaps what we do if Canada decides not to listen to us right what do you think is the answer to that problem i think we saw the answer in the last week maybe the last two days um you know i hesitate to talk about it because i don't want to be part of the of the problem but what you have to wonder why it is that the prime minister so quickly reversed course on the emergencies act he looked like he was prepared to lock in and have it in place for a month and you know what, some great speeches in the Senate, maybe they were going to vote it down because they saw what the rest of us saw, that it was ludicrous to try to invoke something that used to be called the War Measures Act. When you've got a real war happening with Russia and Ukraine, trying to pretend that people with bouncy castles and hot tubs are posing the same threat, it was ludicrous. It was being called out by the Senate. He was getting, get, getting himself an international black eye for his overreach, but the main overreach was locking up people's bank accounts. Yes, yes. That, to me, I think was when everyone, there's a collective gasp. I mean, when you look at the stories that went out there, and I did speak with the uh, JCCF, they have sworn affidavits from two individuals who said that they gave a minor amount of money to the convoy protest and appeared in Ottawa, and they had their accounts frozen. So it wasn't just the multi-million dollar funds that were under the Freedom Convoy. It was regular individuals having their bank accounts frozen, not being able to buy groceries or gas or pay their mortgage bills. Like that is terrifying that government would use that kind of power. And so what I think happened is people, I don't know about you, but almost everyone I talked to had a story of, yeah, I went to my bank and withdrew some cash, or I'm looking at changing over to a credit union because I don't trust those big banks, or I've ordered gold. I even had someone contact me asking if I would do a podcast on how to move money offshore. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, truly, I think a lot of people moved money out. I know truly, of at least two, 10 of my close friends that pulled hundreds of thousands of dollars out of the bank. There you system. go. And so um, I, I I don't, I want to see how it's going to get reported. Um, I gather Martin Armstrong, I don't know if he's always correct in what he writes, but he said there was a 500% increase in the amount of money withdrawn. So I think everyone went into a state of panic, realizing how much uncertainty they'd put into the banking system, uh, into the banking system. But you know what? That sows the seed for me of what do we do to get some, leverage. I think Albertans should repatriate their money to Alberta. We should be putting our money into credit unions and ATB. We should be making sure that uh, that as much of our assets are back here, which means having our own Alberta provincial plan, uh, our own Alberta provincial pension plan, and developing an Alberta sovereign wealth fund with some of the excess revenues that we get from this latest boom, start building that up. Maybe take over employment insurance as well, because that hasn't been ha- hasn't treated Alberta workers particularly fairly either. Uh, start collecting our own income tax. To me, money talks, and the the, the fact money talks and walks, and and that's to me maybe the the seed of getting their attention is to just say, you know what, We're, we can take care of our own stuff actually. And once we've established our own provincial tax collection system uh, for income tax, then we can start negotiating tax point transfers. We can say, you know what, don't send us cash through the health transfer, just transfer us tax points, we'll take care of it from here. We don't want your money from a Canada social transfer either, just transfer us the tax points. We don't want your money from and to tell us how to run our daycare program just transfer us the money. We can't get any of that autonomy until we start putting some of these things in place. We need our own uh, provincial pension plan, our own employment insurance, our own income tax collection. We need our own law enforcement as well. We need to have our own provincial police force so we can build it around the culture and values and priorities that are in Alberta. And I can tell you, it's not the priority of Albertans to go after people who have a uh, a 22 shooting gophers on their farm it seems to be that that's the priority of the of the federal government. Certainly not the priority here. So, so to me, if we if we start looking at things through a financial lens, realizing that's where the pressure point is for the federal government to pay any attention to us whatsoever, they're not going to keep paying attention to us if we keep doing things the same old way. If we keep yes. paying disproportionately into every single program and just accepting that they're that they're going to, to hive off a portion so they can win votes in Quebec and only send a tiny amount of it back, we've got to we've got to really start it on the financial side. 
I, that, that's good. Um, now, the question that everyone wants me to ask, and I'm going to ask, uh, even though I didn't tell you I was going to ask this, is you mentioned in the Western Standard that if the job was open for Premier, you would be willing to run again. Why would you do that after everything that happened before, right? Um, and then what you've been through, right? You you are now uh, like the debutante of uh, Calgary. Like you get, everyone loves you now. You, you, I think, restored your reputation to the time on the radio. So why do you want to run if the job was open? <laughs> if the job was open. Well, it's one of those things where, you know, I hope people can can forgive me for the way I exited politics because I, I exited badly um, and made, uh, I made a pretty dumb decision. I mean, people had, had hired me to be the official opposition leader. And I think we did a fabulous job holding Ed Stelmack to account and Alison Redford to account. And when Jim Prentice uh, came in, I, people expect, expected me to do the same thing. They wanted me to hold him to account as well. And I should have done that. I should have made him prove to us that he was going to be the type of leader that I initially thought he was going to be. Because I think with the passage of time, we saw that he, that he was not going to implement the kind of things that we've been talking about here. So, so I, I, made, I made a mistake. And uh, I, I heard loud and clear from my constituents. I didn't even win my nomination. <laughs> and it took, yeah, it took yeah. a while. It took a while for people to, to like me again when I, when I was on, on the radio. But to me, I, I often say I wish I had had six years on talk radio before running for political office because it just changes your perspective. When you talk to people day in, day out, and hear how the decisions of politicians are impacting them. We had some pretty raw conversations on the air. And, and I learned so much through that process. I started a business through that process. So I went through the ups and downs along with every other business that had to be closed multiple times because I had a restaurant too. I went through the humiliation of being forced to uh, to implement the, the the government's edicts or face closure and understood exactly how that feels when you've got minimum wage staff that are expected to enforce government vaccination passport rules. I mean, I feel I felt all of that in a way that I don't think politicians did. I often thought, gee, if I was on the air, I'd ask every one of them to come and be a hostess for a day and ask people to share their private health information and see how they felt about it. But that's, I guess, just it is, you know, when you're, when you're in talk radio and doing the kind of work I've done in the last six, six years, you just realize how much of a voice is missing right now. Like we need somebody who can heal this province. We need somebody to go and have town hall meetings. And rather than just open up the mic and lecture people for 45 minutes, take two questions and leave, you need to say, hey, I'm just here to listen. Tell us what the last two years have been like to you. Tell us about the friends and family that you we've got a that that you've lost. Um, either either because of, of what has happened or you've lost relationships with because you have difference of opinion. I mean, we're all Albertans and I have never felt like we're more we're more divided and it's been our government who has divided us. So those are the reasons that I would want to run. I is is that I, I feel like I just have the ability to to listen and, and care about what has happened to people just because I've had that experience doing it for the last six years. I miss it. And I also don't want to see the conservative movement split again. I um, my my biggest mistake in uh, in trusting the uh, in trusting Jim was believing that the Wild Rose values would be implemented in some way in in the decisions the government made. And I think that Brian G must feel the same way. I mean, I think he probably feels like he thought that as the standard bearer of Wild Rose when I left, that that when when he made the decision to help bring the parties together, that Wild Rose values would also be expressed in the new party. And they're not. And mm -hmm. so um we have to like I would I would I would love to see if the if the opportunity uh, presented itself uh, some of the some of the strong voices from the wild rose days uh, coming in to make sure that this doesn't happen again. If we're going to keep this movement together, then we have to honor the the legacy and culture of both parties. And one of the legacies of the wild rose party was this absolute belief that we need to have representatives that represent what the values and priorities are in that individual riding. It's not the job of an MLA to be told 
by a staffer in the premier's office. Here's your marching orders. Go out and you tell people what we think. It's the other way. It's supposed to be when the executive makes certain decisions, they have to be prepared to take their lumps if they get it wrong. And the MLAs have to be have to be free to go out and state their, their true views and solicit the views of their people and take that back to the legislature. That's what it's all about. And I see precious little of that. And so if I can help to, uh, to bring that wild rose culture back into the, the UCP, should the job come open, <laughs> that would be the, the reasons that I'd, I'd want to run. Because if we, if, we, if we see the split happen, this is what my greatest fear was is that um, I was beginning to see how progressive Alberta was becoming. And we're now even more progressive than, than it was back in, in 2015. If we have a united progressive movement around Rachel Notley, and we have the conservative movement divided between the UCP and whatever party Brian Jean leads and Paul Hinman with the Wild Rose Independence and Drew Barnes running a rural party and who knows what else, that's a recipe for an NDP government in 2023. And if we have an NDP yeah. government in 2023, uh, Rachel Notley's a young woman. She knows how to do this. She could be there for two or three terms, and then and then Alberta will will not be the be same. Be different place. forever. Yeah, it won't be the same. Place. Um, one last thing: you've experienced what I like to say is cancel culture, and you mm. left. Um, you left radio. I don't think everyone knows your story of why you did. I was at a meeting last night where a lady that worked with you talked about it, and like I'm just it's just further confirmed in my mind that this is a story people need to know. Because you, we just had, what was the doctor's name that we just had, Zach? Dr. Julie Panas. Oh, Julie Panas, yeah. Yeah, we just had Dr. Julie Panas on right before you. She'll be in the, the next episode that's coming out. And her courage is really inspiring. And honestly, I think your courage is too. And I think people need to know that because people have an impression of you as someone, you know, because of the floor crossing that waffles. But you're not that person. You're actually a person of principle. So why do you leave uh, your radio show? You know, it's one of those things where people, you have to, you have to know when to fight and know when I'm having the Kenny Rogers song going through my head. No when to hold them, no when to fold them, no when to, <laughs> no when to I can walk say, away. No when no to when when walk to away, <laughs> no when to run. That's what I also I, miss. Exactly. I, got to, I used to sing when I was on the air from time to time, but there is some truth to that. Um, and uh, I would have, people wanted me to stay on the air because they, they, I, I honestly think we'd be, we'd be better off if there were more people willing to do the, the show the way I did, where you hear from one side, you hear from another, you give your opinion, you allow people to call in to give theirs. We need to have those public spaces where you can have the full range of views expressed. Sometimes there's some spicy views expressed. Sometimes there's some conspiratorial views expressed, but that gives you the ability to have someone call in and say, no, 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 you've got that all wrong. We don't have that now. We have this polarization where we 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 have our our confirmation biases because we only go to the sources that agree with us, and that is going to I think cause more and more division. So it saddens me that I was put in a position where I had to leave the air. But it was it was pretty clear. I'd received a letter of discipline that basically said you have to bring your coverage in alignment with the corporate uh, view, otherwise you won't be able to stay on the air. And so at that point, you make a choice of do you stay true to yourself. Um, so that you can have some integrity and look at yourself in the mirror in the morning? Or do you just say, well, this job is so great, I can compromise myself and just keep the job. And I, I've never really been that type of person to just go along to get along, as you probably know. And I also- <laughs> Well, you were the leader I, of the wild road after all. <laughs> well, truly, I, and I loved being opposition leader. It was great fun. Yeah. But I, I think that's that's part of it is that you there, there is a, a there's a point for every person where you have to you have to feel like you have integrity. And for me, it was really, really important that people knew the kinds of things, stories I wasn't able to do. I mean, to, to give you, it's, it's hard doing uh, three and a half hours of, of radio every day, but to do it knowing that um, you've got three people who are editing and sanctioning people who you can't have that person on, there were times where I would be in a break and um, have a guest lined up for when we came back from the break and they'd be canceled. So I had to change my last, you know, a half an hour worth of time I had to fill without having a guest. Like that's a really stressful environment to be operating under, to not know if something that I said after the fact was going to be deemed to be problematic. 
and uh, even or to get some permission to do something and then be told months later, oh, you never should have done that. It created too much uncertainty. And it was just an environment where especially when I started seeing the left get get canceled, when I saw James Bennett from the New York Times get forced out for publishing a column from Tom, uh, Senator Tom Cotton about Black Lives Matters. I mean, he said that the military should be called in to, to deal with it. And that caused such an outrage in the newsroom that uh, he ended up getting forced out. Jessica Mulrooney having a private conversation with someone she thought was a friend, and all of a sudden that got blown up, and she's pe- depicted as somebody who is white privileged and racist of all things. Um, and there's a, a few other, and Wendy Mesley. I mean, you, you don't survive in the culture of the CBC for 30 years if you're a racist. But you know, she named, named the name of a book that had a, a, a word in it that cannot be named, and her staff complained against her, and she got forced out, and she's not been back. So when I saw that the the left was being vicious, even with their own people. I thought, you know what, I'm, I just have a big bullseye on me. So, and I did even have people uh, from from one of my audiences, because um, I was doing both Calgary and Edmonton at the time, tell me, I'm sitting by the by the radio, listening to every word you say, taking notes, so that if you say something, I'm going to make sure that I get a group of people to contact your boss so that you'll be fired. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I can I can handle pretty well anything. People can. I, I've been in the public eye for a long, long time. Um, when people criticize me, it it doesn't it doesn't it just blows off me. But to have somebody, but to know that we're in an environment now where if you misspeak, there's no redemption, there's no way back. It's you're immediately canceled. Your reputation is in ruins, and you're never able to work again. And there's no pathway back. That's not who we are, I don't think. And I, I need to spend some time thinking about how to correct that. But I just felt like if I stay in this environment, doing the kind of coverage that I'm doing, I'm going to get canceled. And then I, I won't get another chance to, to be on the in the in to be a thought leader again. And, and so I felt like if I could keep my powder dry, I might get another chance. And I've been delighted to be able to do podcasts. And I'm continuing to write a biweekly column. I, uh, I have my newsletter. So I've got a, a group of people who I've told them, hey, look, you're not going to like everything I say, but here's how free speech works. I'm free to say what I want and you're free to cancel. <laughs> and I also have uh, my only social media I engage on is on my locals channel, which is also um, sort of a, a subscription type of approach. So I, I feel like I can get enough of my message out in a way where uh, I'm not going to be deplatformed or targeted. And I, I really hope that I can do some work in the future to change this. But I feel like it's getting so much worse. And I don't know if, we, if we've turned the corner yet on getting back to a point where you can have two people with different views, sit down, talk with each other, and try to find some area of common ground. But that, is, that I think, is what we desperately need. Well, I know you have to go here. Uh, I just wanted to thank you so much for coming on, for your perspective. And honestly, I think the thing that I'm most impressed by is your resilience. A lot of people wouldn't be able to go through, I mean, what you've gone through. And on a personal note, right? Like recently I've started to do these meetings where I'm, you know, campaigning against the premier. There's a target on my back. And what's interesting about that is now people have started coming to the meetings and accusing me of being an alcoholic, right? Oh. But, you know, I struggled with alcohol abuse and I'm seven months sober. But it's so funny because what I've found, and I learned this from you, is take everyone's criticism mm. and turn it into your strength. Mm-hmm. I'd say, yes, I, I am in recovery. Honesty is the key here, right? Like, yes, I don't want to drink again. I was not a good drinker, right? But that's okay because we're humans and we all make mistakes and we got to get rid of this notion that you can't make a mistake and if you do, you're done because that's not human. Mistakes are how we learn. Oh, David, you just literally gave me goosebumps on that because that is that is so true. We used to be so much more kind to each other, honestly. And even if somebody had a different viewpoint, you could still be kind to them and they'd be kind back to you. And and I think that that, uh, you know, maybe that's that is the solution is you just you be sincere. You be who you are. If you if you F up, you say, yep, I F'd up. And then you talk it through and hopefully Ralph move Klein past taught us that. that, I think. Right. Truly, Ralph we forgot Klein it. was a utterly you know, troubled human being who rose above his own weaknesses to try to help others. Yeah. I think we all have a lot to learn from that. Totally agree. Thanks so much for the conversation, guys. Yeah. Thanks for coming. I know you got to go. 
love the conversation. And I hope we talk to you again soon. Definitely. Definitely. Look forward okay. to it. See ya. Thank you for listening to The Canadian Story. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at The CAD Story. That's The CAD Story. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with your friends and family. Let's work together to remind Canadians how great our country is.